So when it comes to dating, finding the one in a sea of 7.4 billion people can seem next to impossible. But what if there weren't so many of us around? What if you only encountered the opposite sex once in your entire lifetime? What lengths would you go to to simply find a partner? Well, how about this? <laughs> this is the phantom anglerfish, a deep sea fish. Um, the female is right here. She's just about two inches long. And this little nub that you see under here is her parasitic male. He's only about a quarter of an inch. Now, <laughs> Because this species uh, lives in a, an environment that is so vast and dark, and their populations are so spread out, uh, when a male actually finds a female, his best and really only strategy is to bite into her body, uh, fuse his tissues with hers, and become nothing more than a permanent sack of sperm whose only function is to fertilize her eggs. Right? So <laughs> um, that's an extreme solution, um, but it has to be. It has to be because the stakes are very high when it comes to sex. And that's because sex is the currency of evolution. And without it, a lot of the species that we know today would simply not exist. And so this type of mating strategy may seem unusual, but it evolved through something called sexual selection. Um, and this is a term that Darwin coined to describe what females want and what males will do to mate with them. And there's a common misunderstanding or misconception uh, that animals have it easy. Sex is cut and dry in the animal kingdom. Um, but the phantom anglerfish is really in just one of many examples of how complicated sex can be in the animal kingdom. Um, and I'm here to sort of delete that misconception. And so hopefully revealing a little bit of this complexity will allow us here in this room to learn a little bit more about ourselves when it comes to interacting with the opposite sex. And who wouldn't want that, right? So let's start with the female uh, side of the story. What is it that females find sexy in males? Well, although this varies from species to species, it usually boils down to which males have the best possible genes that he can um, give to the female uh, and pass on to her offspring. And so um, females essentially have to be very, very picky. Many of us in this room may understand this, right? But have you ever wondered why you're so picky? Um, it's because eggs are very expensive. They're limited, and they expire with age, right? Whereas males produce a ton of sperm, and they can produce it into old age. And so for females, it's always about quality over quantity. And so in many species, looks are what matter the most. Some of you may recognize these birds. These are called birds of paradise. They're known for their very um, uh, colorful plumage, and they typically have an equally extravagant and obnoxious song and dance to match. Uh, we don't just see this in birds, we also see it in uh, this fancy little guy here. He's called the peacock jumping spider. Um, now this guy is really bright and bold and he has these great patterns to show off his quality to the female. We're going to take a little look at what else he does. Now he has a hypnotic dance. <laughs> And this dance is actually highly choreographed, and it's something that males learn uh, when they're ready to have sex. So what females do is essentially they compare the song and dance and color of this male, and they choose the guy with the best dance. The guy with the best dance has the best genes. And so we're going to pass this on again <laughs> uh, to the next generation. Now, being super bright and bold like this and obnoxious, um, this can really get you a lady. It can also get you eaten, <laughs> okay? If you're obnoxious, you're also obnoxious to, uh, to a predator and you can be seen very, very easily. Um, now, being obnoxious can, can also have its consequences and a great species dem to demonstrate this is something called the uh, male long-tailed widow bird. Okay, widow bird. Um, now, at one point in the evolutionary history of this species, males had a much shorter tail. And all it took was one female to find a slightly longer tail sexy, and it snowballed from there. To the point where the males of the species now have such a long and heavy tail that they can only fly about four feet off the ground. <laughs> um, this is problematic, right? If you, you're a really easy target for predators at this point. So you may ask yourself, well, when, how does this exist? How can males have such a long tail if they get eaten all the time? Well, the fact is that females tend to like males who take risks, right? And who can still survive to have sex. 
And so, because of this, th these are really good demonstrations of really good quality genes. So looks aren't, they're good, right? And, and females can choose males based on looks, but they're not always the most important thing. Sometimes females like stuff. Sometimes we like a good meal. I like a really good meal, right? And sometimes males can actually become that meal for the female. Um, <laughs> we see this type of sexual cannibalism um, in a lot of spider species, including um, this one here, which is the black widow you might be familiar with. Um, and she, what she's doing here is devouring her much smaller male slash prey. And we also see this in the praying mantis. Uh, the female right here, uh, you can see what's in her jaws. It's the head of her male partner. And so they actually always devour their partner's head first while having sex. Um, of course, so this can continue uh, to exist, this behavior. Um, the females have to make sure that the sperm have been transferred before they munch away. <laughs> so um, you might understand that this is a really good benefit to the female, right? She gets a great meal out of the situation. She also gets her eggs fertilized, right? Done and done. Um, but <laughs> what, about, what about the male? What does he get out of this huge sacrifice of his life simply to have sex? Well, he still also gets to pass his genes on to the next generation before he dies. Um, and he's also providing nourishment for his future offspring, so it works. Um, now, some species have been able to kind of avoid this entire, um, well, not the entire situation. They still get eaten a little bit. Uh, but they avoid their sac sacrifice of their lives to uh, the cause of having sex. So what we see uh, here is a cricket species called the sagebrush cricket. Um, and like most species, this cricket has a, a big pair of wings right here that are used for flying. Now, in order to get away with their lives, males have also evolved uh, another little pair of wings right here, and their purpose is not for flying. They are to satisfy the female's hunger while having sex. So they've actually grown these wings simply for the female to munch on while they're in the act. And so by the time the male has been able to, to fertilize the female's eggs, she's done eating, and he can go and escape with his life. Um, now the problem here, the caveat, is that females tend to prefer males who are virgins, and so if you don't have your wings intact, you really don't have a really good shot of, of getting female attention. Okay? Now evolution has taken this one step further and allowed some males to get away completely without being eaten at all. Um, and an example of this is a scorpion fly, another insect. On the top there you see the male, um, and on the bottom there's the female. And what he has in his uh, jaws here is an insect. And we call this in the science community a nuptial gift. And so what this tasty insect or uh, nuptial gift serves the purpose of is to feed the female. And he offers it to her so that she will decide, OK, you know, you're good enough to have sex. I'll eat your meal, and then I'll have sex with you. Um, and so the way that females can determine the male's um, genetic quality in this situation is they typically uh, will mate with the males that have the biggest insect present. And the reason for this is that um, males who are stronger and tend to take more risks are the ones that can capture bigger bugs. And these are qualities, again, that females would like to pass on to their own offspring. Okay, so, so far we've seen that females like the way that males look, right? They like stuff, they like to eat. Um, but sometimes all it really takes is a male to smell really good. Okay? <laughs> so this is the North American porcupine. We have him here in Illinois. Um, and in this situation, scent is a really important, or plays a really important role in how uh, females choose their male partners. So in the beginning of this mating scenario, females will uh, urinate all around them to attract the opposite sex. And males will sort of sneak into the general vicinity um, and when they do, of course, they have to approach very cautiously, right, with all those quills. And they have to sort of court the female from a distance. And so the way that they do this is they climb a tree, they get on their hind legs, they march, and they wave their arms from side to side. <laughs> now, I don't know about you, but that would get my attention. <laughs> so. <laughs> Once this grabs the female's attention, um, what the males will do, and this gets a little bit interesting, is they send a six-foot stream of urine 
from the erect penis in the female's direction, soaking her <laughs> from head to toe. <laughs> now, if a female digs this, right, she's into the smell, it's really kind of nice, and the male's got to have really good genes if he smells really good, she'll agree to mate with him. Now, if she does not like the smell, she vigorously shakes off as much urine as she can, she screams, <laughs> and she, <laughs> she, <laughs> she will actually run as fast as she can, can in the opposite direction away from this guy. But scent is important. It does play a role. And it also plays a role in, um, in sex as well, when it comes to sex. So in a lot of different um, moth species, uh, both males and females will emit these chemical signals called pheromones. And pheromones are these little signalers that um, attract the opposite sex when mating is to happen. Um, now in this species, called the bristly cutworm moth, um, What's interesting here is that the, the quality of a male is actually determined by a completely different species altogether. The female bolas spider. All right, now this spider is cool for a lot of reasons, and I'm gonna tell you about them in a second. But um, what this female bolas spider will do is she is able to beautifully mimic the pheromone of the female moth. And you can imagine why she does this. She's attracting all of the male moths um, and these unsuspecting male moths who are attracted to this, this mimicked pheromone are expecting to have sex. And instead they meet their fate as a meal for the female bolas spider. So we're going to take a look at her in action. Um, the other cool thing about this spider is that she does not build a web. She builds a lasso. How cool is this? So here's the male moth. He's just completely like, do 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 do, right? I'm trying to find a male or a female. She spins the lasso over her head when he comes in near and he, right? Blows my mind every time. So um, this is what happens, of course. Um, the, the males meet their fate. Um, you might ask yourself, though, why or how does this show to the female moth that, that this is a good male? Well, it kind of works indirectly where the males that actually survive and are still around and smell good are the ones that have the best genes. And so what the females are choosing here are males that have escaping genes, right? So you want your own offspring to escape, to survive to the point where they can reproduce. And any offspring that you have, they're going to indirectly pass your genes on to the next generation as well. So you'll be re represented in the future genetically. OK. So females are picky. We've learned this, right? They like uh, appearance. They like uh, a meal. They like how males smell. They're really, really, really picky. Um, but what about males? What is it that they will do to have sex with females? Um, in short, the answer is anything. <laughs> um, <laughs> and so we're going to take a look at, at some of these examples. Um, remember, for males, it's all about quantity over quality. Sperm is cheap. And so the way to pass your genes on, if you're a male, is to, again, mate with as many females as you possibly can within your lifetime. Okay, so they've, they've, uh, even though it may seem unconventional to us, again, the stakes are very, very high. And so when there are a lot of males competing for females, there's going to be a lot of competition. So you've probably watched a nature show, maybe here and there, and seen big males fight it out, right, for access to females. And so in, in many species, we see um, size being important, brute strength, elaborate weaponry like teeth and horns and tusks and you name it. And typically, the biggest, strongest males will outcompete other males and gain access to females. So this is great, right? Big males get to have sex and pass their genes on. But does this mean that small males never get to have sex? No. Nature always finds a way. And so we're going to talk about a couple of strategies that smaller males can use um, to still pass their genes on. And these strategies are all based on deception, which is why we call these males sneaker males. So this first alternative strategy to being big and strong and, and fierce um, is called female mimicry. So essentially, if you're a mid-sized male, um, you have the option of mimicking the appearance of a female to sneak past all the big ones and basically go in and mate, and you're, it's all done. Um, and this, this example is beautifully demonstrated by a species uh, called the cuttlefish. This is a, a relative of squid and octopus and things like that. And in this photo here, you see on the very far um, right, this is a female. 
and she's being courted by a big male cuttlefish here. Okay, so he's trying to get her attention, he wants to have sex, until this other big male starts to encroach on his territory. Okay, so when this happens, this guy, what is he going to do? He's going to pay attention to this other big male and try to fight him off. So this is where the sneaking comes into play. This may look like a female, but it's another male. This is a sneaker male. And so he matches beautifully the shape, the size, the color, the patterning of the female. And so what he'll do is he'll sneak past everybody else and get his opportunity to mate. And this is something, uh, this camouflaging ability is really something um, unique to cuttlefish and, and squid and things like that. So they can really employ this strategy pretty well. Um, another strategy we see as an alternative to being big is demonstrated by this species here. Um, this is called the sponge louse. The plural is sponge lice. They get their name from uh, the fact that they live in these tiny little sea sponges that you find in the ocean. Very, very tiny little sea sponges. In this species, there are actually three different types of males that all have a different way of getting to a female and mating with her. So right here is the big male. He's our alpha. And he's much larger than everybody else. Um, so he has size on his side. He also has these little things called uropods. These are his weapons. And essentially what he does is if another big male comes by, he stands on his head and he pushes other males off the sponge with these things here. We also have another strategy in the middle here. Um, this is the beta. And essentially he's the female mimic. So he looks exactly like this female here. They're virtually indistinguishable. Now this second um, alternative strategy to being big is demonstrated by this guy here. He's our gamma male. He's tiny. His strategy is being small. And so basically what he does is he can not only sneak by the big guys and the female mimics, but he also sneaks past the females themselves. And so he just sort of sneaks out in and out of um, all these little sea sponges and mates with as many females as possible. Okay? So there are ways to become um, a winner in the mating game if you're typically a loser. Okay? Uh, so size doesn't always matter. Um, and we also see other species using deception in a, a sort of more extreme way, um, and that's using a scare tactic to uh, basically mate with females. And um, you might have seen these before if you've ever been in a lake or a pond. Um, these are called water striders, another insect species. And the way that these males attract females is they make these little vibrations on the surface of the water with their legs. And again, this is to impress the female. Uh, if the female is impressed, what she will do is expose her genitalia and allow him to mate with her. Um, if she is unimpressed and refuses to mate with this guy, um, what this male uh, water strider will do is he will continue to make these vibrations, but not to impress this lady. Instead, he will actually continue to make these uh, vibrations to attract predatory insects and fish that are lurking underneath the surface of the water. Why does he do this? Um, he knows that the female's only strategy is to stay as incredibly still as she can. Um, and when she does this, of course, uh, she gets taken advantage of. Um, but uh, what the, the risk to the female is much greater than it is to the male because in this particular situation, the males are always on top. Okay? So another way, or another uh, species that uses a similar kind of scare tactic um, is this moth species right here. Now, in a lot of moths, uh, they have the ability to emit these ultrasonic clicks, so these sounds that we can't hear um, as humans. Um, and they emit these clicks in the presence of bats, which are their main predators. And they do this because it actually jams the, the uh, sonar of the bats, and so it prevents them from finding the moths and eating them. In this species, called the armyworm moth, the females don't have this ability. And in fact, we only find this um, clicking ability in the male moths. Furthermore, researchers have actually found that these male moths don't ever use these clicks in the presence of bats. So they must not serve the same function. Instead, they've only ever found them uh, emitting these clicks in the presence of female moths. And so you might ask why. The answer is that they are actually putting out a false alarm that there's a predator around. Now again, the female's only um, defense mechanism is to stay still. And so again, these male moths are able to uh, take advantage of the situation and have sex with the females. Now before we move on, you might think that these are some really like, mean, nasty guys, right? But you have to remember that the, the, the stakes are so high 
and, and sex is the currency of evolution, and so you need these things um, in order to have species continuing to exist. Now I'm gonna end with another example here of um, deception, and we're gonna move away from insects for a minute and focus on a mammal. Okay, so this is the topi antelope. Uh, they're an African species. They make their, plains, uh, their, their lives in the plains uh, of Africa. And um, in this particular species, uh, females are only able to conceive one day out of the entire year. Okay, so that's a problem, right? <laughs> How does sex even happen? How do they continue to exist? Well, because of this, there's a ton of competition among males for any female that's there. And so they have these uh, weapons that we talked about before, right, horns or antlers. And um, so the big males will typically fight it out for the females. But again, there's always gonna be an alternative strategy. And so other males use um, a form of deception, again, to gain access to females. We're gonna take a look at a video um, that shows this. If it will play. Yeah, okay. All right, so um, just off screen, I'll set this up, is a group of females. And they're sort of just um, hanging out, eating. And um, what this male is doing is he's actually staring off into the distance. And as he's staring off into the distance, he's spotting a predator. Um, and uh, since this is not playing, I'm not gonna actually make the snorting sound. <laughs> like I could, <laughs> um, but he, <laughs> maybe I will. So he essentially goes, mm, mm, right? Um, uh, that's my best. And this, this sound is recognizable by all other uh, topi antelope as, well, there's a predator around, right? So be vigilant. Uh, what he does, when he does this, actually, there's no predator at all. And again, this is a false alarm. And so the females uh, that were just off screen, um, again, stay really still. And the reason that he does this is he actually wants to keep them there longer so he has more time to impress them. And then his ultimate reward is essentially to mate with all of them. Um, so there's another really great strategy that males, well, males will use. Now, when all else fails and um, being big and strong or deceptive really doesn't work, evolution has given some species sort of a backup method. And we see this backup method being used in this common little guy here who is a fruit fly. Um, his species name is Drosophila bifurca. Um, and in this species, uh, both males and females are highly promiscuous, which means that they mate with as many uh, partners as they possibly can, and they don't discriminate. Okay, so what, what has happened in this species is that females are able to then store the sperm of a lot of different males, and the competition among males that happens in this species happens after sex. And it does so through a process called sperm competition where sperm of different males will actually compete physically within the female's reproductive tract. How weird is that? But it happens, and the biggest, strongest, fastest sperm are the ones that reach the eggs first, and so they have the best genes. Now, in order to produce a lot of sperm and to mate with a lot of females, you need gigantic testicles. <laughs> and when I say gigantic, I mean that if they were on a human man, they would weigh 20 pounds a piece. Okay. All right. Not only that, but the sperm of these guys are 1,000 times the length of a human sperm, which means that, again, if you were a man or are a man, um, each individual sperm would be about 120 feet long. Now, <laughs> okay. Men produce over a million sperm every day. Okay, imagine that. Um, so that's a lot to carry around with you. <laughs> yeah. So <laughs> not just this stuff, but there's one other really cool thing about this fly. There are certain chemicals in the semen of these male fruit flies that when they have sex with a female, these chemicals automatically shut down her libido for seven hours. So she doesn't mate with any other male. And the reason for this is it gives that male sperm a head start towards the eggs. Okay, so not a bad deal for this guy, right? He may have a lot to carry around, but there's a, there's a reward for it. Um, so hopefully I've been able to delete this misconception that, that you know, sex in the animal kingdom is easy. Evolution needs sex to drive forward. And this is why the battle of the sexes is so intense 
and has such vi uh, vital consequences. And so hopefully it gives some um, uh, a push or support for why animals might go to such great lengths to make sure sex happens. Animal behavior is complex, even in species like the fruit fly that we may deem insignificant. And so the next time that you are cursing the opposite sex or you're bemoaning the fact that somebody tried to set you up on a blind date, remember this. It's still probably better than just being a permanent sack of sperm. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much for your attention. I really appreciate it.